behind every evil work and every whispering thought, every sleeping spirit. We come against it in the name of Jesus. We lose the joy and the peace of God right now, the power of God. Lose the anointing that makes preaching easy. We thank you right now in advance for increase and souls to be saved. We give you praise and glory. Someone shout in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus will keep you. Very simple concept, a very important, very powerful mindset to have. Because we live in a world that seems like everything is constantly in flux. You know, things are going haywire almost daily. But as you walk with God, you learn to accept these things. Uh, you have to always remember that Jesus is in control. It's a, it's a mindset that will help you to keep moving forward in life. And I, I really marvel at the things that God has allowed to happen in our lives and in the lives of those that are in the Word of God. Just so that He can help us to understand that He's in control of all things. Even when we look at the life of Job and the, the story of Job, uh, Job lost everything. His house, his cars. Oh, they had cars. But they had cars. He would have lost those cars too. Lost his kids, his family members, servants. And he was down to nothing. And he probably would have done, I probably would have done the same thing. They started questioning, like, why? Why? Because you know, we don't, in our minds, we don't expect things to go wrong when we walk with God. We have a kind of a preset notion in our thought process that once you get saved, everything goes fine. But you learn quickly that that's not the case. And you can get to a place where you're asking God, why are you allowing this? And in that story, Joel, God doesn't really give him an answer as to why. He gives him the answer that I'm God and I'm in control. That I can take and I can give. And it helps us not to be so clingy to the stuff and be more clingy to him. Because he is the source of everything that we have. And so in the story, even after at the end, God says, now I'm going to give you back double for your trouble. And so even though you might be in trouble, God's going to bring you out of it. Hello, somebody. Just took me this morning. I'm not going to be long. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. I love this particular portion of the text. Because it really nails home the, the whole idea that I'm talking about this morning. And how God allows things to happen in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 through 4. And you know, uh, when you're going, things are going well for you, it's just really fine and dandy. It's easy to praise and worship God. But when you get into the midst of the fire, sometimes it's a different attitude, a different mindset. You start uh, asking, is the Lord really with me? Remember, John the Baptist was super happy when he baptized Jesus in the Jordan. He was all happy and I baptized him. Behold the Lamb of God. But when he got in jail, he says, oh, sir, are you the one or should we look for another? Because I'm up in jail and I was doing fine until you came along. And Jesus said, tell him, blind see. Things are still happening. And so I, I, I don't think anything when a person starts, you know, kind of wavering a little bit when they're in trouble because that's a natural response to life. But this morning God wants just to encourage you that no matter what, He's still in it. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 through 4, we see the concept. Uh, Moses is talking, God is talking to Moses. He tells him in verse 2, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And humble thee and to suffer thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee to know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. Thy raiment waxed not all upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Yes. What was he saying? He said, listen, things are going to happen even after this. You're going to have struggles even after this, but I want you to remember what I brought you through these 40 years. Because even though God brings you out of something, doesn't mean that's the end of it. Even though God works miracles in your life, doesn't mean that's the end of it. And sometimes in our heart, when we're walking with God, we expect everything to be so smooth. And if something, if there is a bump and a ripple, and then God brings us out of it, when the next bump and ripple comes, we forget about the last bump and ripple. And he says, 
I'm allowing things to happen in your life because I want you to learn something about who I am and how I operate. He said, I let you go through in the wilderness and I purposely allowed you to be real hungry. I thought, man, why? I want to be hungry. I want to have food all the time. He's like, no, because sometimes when you have everything all the time, you begin to depend on yourself and you lose the, the, the focus of your dependency must be on Christ. And so he said, I allowed you to go through. I humbled you. I suffered you to be hungry and, and to be alone and be in the wilderness so I can make you to know that, listen, the real substance of life comes from me. You cannot depend on bread alone, but you're going to need to depend on me. I'm the true bread that comes down from heaven. I'm the God that will really give you substance and give you healing and give you strength in your body. That's why I like the altar so much. Sometimes people think, oh, it's the altar of sin. The altar has never been the altar of sin. They, have, they never laid a sacrifice on the altar that was a sinful sacrifice. The, altar that, the sacrifices that were laid on the altar, altar, altar were perfect without any blemish, and they were offered up to God as a sacrifice. And when we come to the altar in the sight of God, we are perfect in His sight. Even though we're doing things wrong, God's looking at us, not the way we see ourselves, but the way that He sees us, the way that He created us. He created us in His image. Now, whether you're walking out what God has created you to be is another thing. And so sometimes people feel bad about coming to the altar because they think, oh, I've sinned. This is not an altar of sin. This is an altar of sacrifice. It's where you come and say, God, here I am. I lay myself on the altar. Do with me what you want to do. I'm through trying to control everything. Hello, somebody. It's easy to try to control everything. It's difficult. To put your life in the hands of God. But God says when you get saved, that's what exactly what he wants you to do. He wants you to put your life in his hands. And he wants to assure you that he can keep you. Psalms 91 verse 1. What does it mean that the Lord can keep you? It means that he can continue or cause to continue in a specific condition or position or course. That means once God starts something, then you can't nobody stop it. If God decides that he's going to keep you in a certain position, can't nobody change that. He that has begun a, begun a good work in you shall continue it until Christ Jesus. He doesn't continue until somebody steps in and stops it. Can't nobody stop what God is working on you in. The areas of your life, the areas of your heart, the areas of your mind. God is in complete control and he's working on you. Developing you, strengthening you, raising you. And he shall continue it and can't nobody block it. That's what it means for God to keep you. He'll keep your mind sound. While everybody else around you is going crazy, you won't go crazy. That's if you let God do it. Oh, it's easy to lose your mind. Easier than you think. But when you have the Lord, he's a mind regulator. He's a heart fixer. He keeps you. What does it mean for him to keep you? It means he continues to hold you. Jesus told those boys, he said, listen, I have you in the palm of my hand and can't nobody pluck you out. When, when you come over to the Lord's side, the thing that's so wonderful about walking with God is that once God grabs a hold of you, can't nobody shake you loose. They can say all kinds of stuff and do all kinds of things and the pressures of life can come, the storms of life will come, come. But the Lord said, listen, I got a grip on you. What are you fussing and, and having anxiety about? I have a grip on you. My hands are wrapped around you and nobody can pluck you out of my hand. Psalms 91, look at this. I love this scripture. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God and him will I trust. A refuge is a place of safety. When you come to God and you put your life in the hands of God, he's, he's a fortress. Can't nobody break in. Your heart becomes guarded when you give your heart to God. Oh, what hurts most people is they try to give their heart to everybody else. But they won't give it to Jesus. And then when they get hurt, they try to blame God. Listen, give your heart to the Lord. Love him and he will love you. Serve him and he will serve you. The devil does it the opposite. He wants you to serve him and then he's going to break you. 
See, when you love the world, that's the devil. And when you love the world, the world don't love you back. Oh, I've been in the world. I know I'm talking about. Maybe you haven't been there. But the world does not love you back. Jesus said the world will hate you because it hates the word. And when you try to run after the world to obtain something that's satisfying to you, you find that you, you end up empty because there's nothing there to satisfy your soul. And the devil's not trying to satisfy your soul. He's not interested in that. He's, he's interested in captivating you and using you as a slave. But God's the opposite. He's interested in giving you liberty and watching over you and giving you satisfaction in life. And it's just a total polarizing opposite. And when you really start walking with God, if you, if you stay the course, you will find that things that you used to do, you don't do no more. And the things that people used to try to get you to do, they can't even persuade you because God be blocking them out. Get up out of here, devil. God will keep you. Come from a hiding place against the storms of life. Surely, in verse 3, he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. You know what a snare of a fowler is? It's a trap that a, that a, a person that traps birds. They set traps and you can't, the bird can't really see it. But then they put something there that's alluring to lure the bird in. And then when the bird gets there, boom, got him. Then the fowler comes up, of course, and cooks them real good. And eats them up. Yeah, that's a tasty fowl. And the devil sets all kind of traps for us. And he tries to put enticing things in there. But the Lord says, I'll deliver you from every trap. Every trick that the devil tries, every scheme, every weapon that he tries to form against you. The Lord says, man, not one weapon can be formed against you that shall prosper. There's going to be no tricks that he can do on you that will cause you to fall or falter. But all you have to do is just walk with him. He says, I'll keep you. Verse 7, he deals with something that's even more extreme than that. He says, a thousand shall fall at that side, ten thousand at the right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. He's really talking about end times. As we get closer to the end times, violence is going to increase in the land. But it's important that you stay close to God. You don't walk in fear. You pray over your children. You lose the angels of God to watch over your household. People will die all around us, but God says, I'm going to, I got you. Uh, I got you as a problem. I, I will protect you. I will keep you. Uh, I do of being kept, but that God tends to us like you keep a garden. Yes. That's what it means. I will keep you. Keep you, uphold you up, strengthen you, encourage you, block folks trying to come in, guard you, got angels set in charge around you to keep you from harm and danger. And that's powerful to be that committed to us. I just want to commit to God. Because he's already committed to you. And he's sending the word this morning to tell you, stop fretting. Because I'm committed to you. I got you. I will keep you if you let me. He says, only with thine eyes shall I behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. He says, because you're coming and you're surrendering yourself unto me, I'm not going to let all this stuff happen to you. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. It's very difficult to embrace these kinds of scriptures when you see uh, Christians around the world being uh, slaughtered and murdered and say, well, what about them? You know, death to us is the end of all things, but death many times is, is the beginning of something great. I talked to someone this morning, he would tell me about someone they love that's sick. And I said, how old are you? He said, 70. I said, are they serious? He said, yeah. I said, we want to pray that God does what he wants to do because if the Lord takes somebody, sometimes it's better than allowing them to suffer. Especially if they're going to step into the kingdom of God. You know, we, we, sometimes we're real selfish. We want them to stay here and suffer in pain and can't walk and go nowhere. And then people got to attend to them and help them. And you want them to stay like that for the next five years because you want to see them. Rather than saying, listen, this person is saved. They served their time on the earth. Why not ask God to let them go on and be with the Lord? Am I for euthanasia? No. But I'm saying we got to have the right mindset about some of the scriptures. He says, listen, I will keep there. No evil shall be brought before thee. These shall any plague, plague come there, not in that house. When these men and women that are serving God in these tough areas, when they are martyred, God literally releases them from the struggle that they're in. 
they step right out of the struggle, right into a place of peace and joy, and leave us behind. I'm like, what? Y'all get to go? I'm not trying to go anywhere, but I'm trying to make a point. We have to have the right mindset about how God does things. And everything that looks bad is not always bad. And everything that looks good is not always bad. Verse 11, very powerful thought. If he's going to keep me, what does he do? He uses his resources. And one of his resources is his angels. Look at verse 11. He says, he shall give his angels charge over thee. That means they have a responsibility. And what is their responsibility? To keep thee in all thy ways. When you're walking with God, you're not walking alone. You've got angels on your left and on your right. Just paying attention to you. You are paying attention to them, but they pay attention to you. One of the most wonderful things about being saved, and I 